so uh, wonderful to, to be here. Hope you can all hear me all right. Um, great. I am Michael Acton Smith. I'm Acton on Twitter, if you want to harass me there. I'm also known as my alter ego, uh, Mr. Moshi, for anyone under 12 in the audience, which is my, uh, my excuse to get dressed up and wear face paints. Um, and it's exciting to be here because I was first at Spring Fair back in 1999, uh, about 16 years ago, when I was uh, just starting out with Firebox. And we had a little stand selling a few products, didn't have a clue what we were doing. So the, the last 16 years have been a, an amazing uh, journey, a real roller coaster of ups and downs. And I thought it would be useful today to share some of the stories uh, and uh, some of the lessons we've learned on this uh, crazy adventure. So it all started uh, when I was at university. I used to be fascinated by these uh, gadgets and boys' toys and remote control helicopters and all sorts of fun stuff. And we'd avidly read these magazines uh, looking for products. And we realized no one was actually selling them. And we thought we'd put a, a website together uh, back in 1998. Uh, and everyone thought we were a little bit mad. And uh, the idea of selling all these toys and gadgets uh, felt a little bit like uh, being in the movie Big, dancing on giant pianos every day. It felt like the perfect job in the world. And I think that's one of the most important things when running a business and being an entrepreneur. You've got to do something that you're passionate about and absolutely love. So it was a, a really interesting, exciting start. But one of the problems with the business was that uh, we were fresh from university. We were students. We didn't have much money. Uh, we were living in an attic in Cardiff that Tom's parents had given us. And uh, we went to the local banks to try and raise some financing. They said no. Uh, they didn't really know what this internet thing was. And uh, like a lot of entrepreneurs, you have to be resourceful. You have to come up with quirky ideas. And so we saw an ad in the local newspaper asking for people to sell their bodies to medical science. So uh, we accepted the challenge. And we went to Merthyr Tidville for a week and uh, were injected 36 times with a new anti-migraine drug and survived and uh, got paid 400 quid for it. And, uh, and that was the, uh, the start of our financing that enabled us to buy our first computer and a bit of stock and get going. And my mum was so impressed, she gave us a thousand pounds to help the business along its way. So we were underway, things were, were going, it was all very exciting. And we decided to call the business Hotbox uh, because Literally, the, the products were so hot, they were bursting out of the box. That was our first logo we designed. It took hours to put together. Um, the only problem with the name Hotbox was we'd registered the domain hotbox.co.uk, and uh, we didn't think it was a problem that we didn't own hotbox.com. Uh, unfortunately, hotbox.com was, and I'm not sure if it still is, but it was at the time one of the world's largest porn sites <laughs> in, in the late 1990s. I see a few faces in the audience that uh, may have visited. Um, and uh, that was a little awkward. We used to get a lot of traffic to our site, but it didn't convert very well. Um, and the most embarrassing part of it was my mum, who was now so proud of her son, who'd gone off to set his own business. Uh, she'd tell all her friends to go and check out this uh, amazing new site, Hotbox. And uh, they'd invariably end up at the wrong place. So that was a bit awkward. We decided then to change the name to Firebox, uh, which doesn't have any dodgy connotations, as far as I know. So Hotbox was uh, trundling along. The early days were really, really difficult. Uh, we didn't have many sales. For anyone that's starting a business, you know what it's like. You don't have cash for advertising. You can't really get the ball rolling. And we realized we needed a killer product. We needed our tipping point. And uh, when I was at school, I used to be very cool. <laughs> I was in the chess club. That's me hiding away in the back row. And uh, after university, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to try and make chess a bit more exciting? So we combined chess with alcohol to create uh, the shot glass chess set. And this is me testing out the first site. Uh, Tom Boardman, my business partner, his mum, this is the attic, his mum had gone out and we raided her crystal drinks cabinet. And uh, this is the first ever game of shot glass chess, vodka against Southern Comfort, which was pretty serious. The idea is that every time you capture a piece, you have to drink it. So there's this wonderful inbuilt handicap system. The better you're doing, the more drunk you get. And uh, this was Tom towards the end of the game uh, after a queen sacrifice. <laughs> and he doesn't normally look like that. Um, but we realized there was something here. This is pretty exciting. And, and this is actually the first product that we made that we took to Spring Fair 
back in 1999 and, and got a few sales for and gave us the confidence to keep building the business. So we got rid of the crystal glasses, we put a proper set together, and uh, it really caught people's imagination. And it, it taught us a very, very valuable lesson, which was the power of a good story. You know, even if you don't have a big budget for advertising, if you've got an interesting, quirky story with a human angle, journalists are going to be very interested in what you're doing. So we managed to get the shot glass chess set in FHM, in Loaded. Uh, we were on BBC Radio Wales. We even made it to page three of The Sun. Uh, not the main picture, thankfully, but uh, a little bit at the bottom. And uh, all that attention uh, gave the business momentum and, and we started growing. So for all of you building businesses, whatever it is, make sure there's an interesting story um, to share that uh, people want to hear about. And this is Firebox now, still, still going strong all those years later with, with new branding. But um, as I mentioned at the start, I think in business it's really important to follow your passions. And, and one of my other passions has always been games. I don't know if anyone remembers this, anyone of a certain age. This uh, was my first ever computer, a ZX Spectrum 48K. And uh, my dad bought it for me when I was young, so I'd do my homework and write thank you letters. But of course, all I wanted to do was play games. And so one of my dreams when I was younger was to build a games company. And uh, that became Mind Candy. And I launched this uh, about 10 years ago. And the first game we created uh, was inspired by a book I'd read when I was very young called Masquerade. I don't know if anyone remembers Masquerade. So this came out, I think, in 1979. And it sparked a nationwide treasure hunt. The author had buried a golden hair somewhere in the British countryside. And if you solved all the clues within the book, you'd find out where it was hidden. And uh, it went super viral. He was on Wogan, which was about the most viral thing you can do back in the late 70s. Um, it was office water cooler discussions. And uh, the idea as a child fascinated me. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to create a modern day version of Masquerade in the internet age? So Perplex City was born. And uh, we buried a treasure somewhere in England. We announced a 100,000 pound prize for the first person that found it. And rather than it just being digital, played across emails and social media, we wanted to have a physical component as well. Uh, I love the idea of um, creating online and offline uh, businesses, and the two tie into each other really well. So we created trading cards and a music album, stickers and a tourist guide and a magazine. And uh, we raised a lot of money from venture capitalists to do this business. We even had live events with actors and helicopters, and we'd raised millions of pounds. And uh, although it was one of the most creative things I've ever done, it was also one of the most commercially disastrous. Uh, we burnt through our money very, very quickly. Um, we attracted a small and passionate audience, but it didn't really catch fire. It was just too complicated. We, we made something that we wanted to play, but didn't resonate with the market. And uh, you know, the lesson I took from that is that it's all right to fail as long as you fail fast. And the mistake we made here was it took us almost two years um, before we realized this wasn't working and uh, a lot of money. And, and that was quite a, a painful experience. But I, uh, I went back to the board. We had a little bit of money left in the bank. And I said, perplexity hasn't worked, but I've got this other idea. I'd drawn a, a little monster character in a coffee shop. And I said, um, I think this could be the next big thing online. And they looked at me slightly strangely. <laughs> and, uh, um, but to their credit, they said, let's, let's give it a go. So this really was at Mind Candy, our last roll of the dice to see if we could create a, a new product. Um, and uh, this was the, the first kernel, the little acorn that grew into Moshi Monsters. And uh, I'd been inspired um, by something else I'd had as a child, the pet rock. I don't know if anyone remembers this. A few nodding heads. So um, this was created by a, a chap in America uh, called Gary Dahl. And he put a rock in a box with some straw and an instruction manual and uh, became a multimillionaire. <laughs> so don't let anyone ever tell you that uh, a product can't be simple to be successful. Um, I thought it was an amazing idea. And I'd also had a Tamagotchi and seen Furby's success. So we wanted to see if it was possible to build an online world with cute, adoptable pet monsters that kids would love and nurture and, and look after. And uh, so I brought a, a small team together with some amazing animators and engineers and uh, artists. And uh, Moshi Monsters slowly, bit by bit, started to come together. This was our first ever website uh, that um, we put live many, many years ago. 
And uh, everyone thinks digital businesses are overnight successes. You know, if you think of Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, they often take years and years of hard graft getting to their tipping point. And for us, it was at least a, a year and a half of, of really nothing much happening, lots of sleepless nights, lots of stress trying to figure it out. And then it caught fire in the summer of 2009. And I think when building something, if you've got that strong conviction, if you're super passionate about it, you know you'll get there eventually. And uh, eventually we did. And I think one of the reasons for that tipping point was that we realized that kids love to be social. They love to share and show off and connect with their friends. And we gave them safe ways to do that. And that's when Moshi really started to, to grow and take off. But it was definitely not a, an overnight sensation. So for those that haven't adopted a monster, this is basically what happens. You fill in the adoption papers, your monster lives in, in a room, and then uh, one of the bits I love most is the hall of puzzles, where kids uh, do puzzles against the clock. They're playing games, but also learning at the same time. And uh, we see this as stealth education. Uh, I think it's one of the most exciting areas. If you can make learning fun, you really can change the world. And it's extraordinary to see how engaged kids are when they're playing games and trying to compete for the high score in the flags game or spelling. But if you turn that around and tell them they're, they're learning something, they are, they're far less engaged. Um, and there's lots of other fun stuff to do in the world of Moshi. There's the grocery store where you can buy food. Uh, there's Yakia for your furniture. Uh, there's the underground disco. There's all sorts of other uh, engaging, colorful things. There's Moshlings that kids can collect and trade. Uh, there's a big world to explore. Very, uh, very rich, um, colorful environment. Lots of adventures. Lots of different characters. We love puns. So uh, some uh, interestingly named uh, folks out there. We love music as well. Um, we have everything from Broccoli Spears to uh, Banana Montana. Lady Goo Goo was one of my favorite characters um, until the day that we got a high court injunction from Lady Gaga, which was a slightly stressful experience. Um, and unfortunately, I can't talk too much more about that <laughs> other, other than to say uh, Lady Goo Goo is, is sadly no more. Um, but one of, the, one of the things I've always thought when building this business, and one of the things I, I think is so important when being an entrepreneur is to think big, is to have a huge vision and mission. And I think that's so important when trying to attract people onto your team, when conversing with journalists, to get people inspired about what you're doing. And Moshi, we always wanted to be much more than a website. And again, for, for anyone out there developing their own products, um, think what comes next. Where are you going to take it? What's the five or 10 or even 100 year journey for your brand? So we wanted to create toys and books and magazines and have them all interlink. And over the years, it, it came true. Um, it was the best selling kids magazine. We sold uh, over 100 million little collectible toys. And there's a fine balance. We tried not to uh, over commercialize Moshi Monsters, but uh, it, was, it was kind of a, a tricky thing to do. Some of the fans loved the brand so much, they wanted to collect absolutely everything. And one of the things about the kids space is when you create a phenomenon, it's very hard for it to stay a phenomenon for, forever. So kids move on and they go into other areas. And like all businesses, we have to reinvent ourselves and figure out what's coming next. And uh, one of the things, uh, one of the real important moments for me a few years ago was uh, when doing my emails with my niece, who, who loves helping me, <laughs> um, she constantly would be swiping and touching the screen. And she assumes everything will respond to her touch, uh, whether it be faces or microwaves or picture frames. And I realized this whole new generation were growing up, this swipe generation, expecting something very different from their entertainment. So we started to, to think deeper in that area. And I think we're still at the early stage of what can be created, not just games for kids on these amazing magical devices, but ways for them to watch videos, or listen to music, or do their homework, or read books, or connect with other kids all around the world. I think it's incredibly exciting. And um, we want to become the greatest entertainment company in the world for this new digital generation. So we're constantly thinking and dreaming up new ideas, looking at where the world is heading. We launched a new game recently called World of Warriors, which is a little bit like Game of Thrones meets Pokemon meets Horrible Histories. Again, uh, it's a lot of fun, but we have a stealth education element layered in there. So you learn about ninjas and Aztecs and gladiators from uh, all sorts of different areas of history. 
And then another really exciting uh, area we've been looking at is uh, something we're calling Pop Jam, which is a creative community for kids where they can share their stories, their art, games they create, animations with other kids around the world in a, a safe environment. So anyone trying to uh, build products for the, the younger generation, we'd love to chat to you and see if there's any partnerships we can do on Pop Jam. And then, because I just love uh, working in a lot of different areas and excited about um, business and the internet, the last uh, product I'm going to mention is something um, I'm working on called Calm, which is uh, uh, the mission is to make the world a little bit less stressed and happier. Our phones are always beeping. There's always a million things going on. And we want to uh, help the world relax a little bit through guided meditations. And as I say, just to wrap up, this is why I think the world is so exciting at the moment. There are two billion people with access to the internet. Uh, that number is going to double over the next few years. There are now more smartphones in the world than toothbrushes. And uh, I don't know whether that's a good or a bad thing, <laughs> but, but it shows there's a huge amount of opportunity to build new products, to disrupt established industries, to create things that, no matter how niche they are, can find an audience out there somewhere. And uh, I honestly believe this is one of the best times in history to be an entrepreneur developing new, exciting products. So whatever you're all working on out there, I wish you the very best of luck. And thank you very much for listening to my story. Yeah.